Good morning and welcome back to the Atlantic Council's coverage live from the IMF World Bank annual meetings here in Marrakesh, Morocco. I'm Josh Lipsky, Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Geoeconomic Center, and I am very pleased to start the day with our distinguished guest, Spain's Vice President, Minister of Economic Affairs and Digital Transformation, Nadia Calvino. Vice President, thank you for joining us once again at the Atlantic Council, not in Washington, but here in Morocco. We appreciate your time. We know how busy your schedule is. And I want to start, we'll get on to all the economic issues, both for Spain, more widely for the Eurozone and the global economy. But I want to start with your outlook, your attitude going into these meetings. When we met in April, I remember you said to me, I'm not optimistic or pessimistic, I'm determined to make the most of the week. How do you feel coming into these meetings in Marrakesh? Well, so good morning, Josh. It's, it's wonderful to, to join you again at the Atlantic Council and to join all those viewers that are following us today. And it's also very impressive to be in these uh, premises, you know, which have been built uh, in the desert near Marrakech. And, uh, and to see how this country has overcome such a tragedy as, as the earthquake. No? I'm very impressed to be here. Uh, and uh, I think that that's a key message that probably we, we have to take away already at the start of the week, which is that the global economy has shown to be more resilient than many expected, uh, and we need to keep it that way. But on the other hand, the world has become even more complicated than when we last met in, in yes. spring. Geopolitical tensions, violence, conflict uh, are on the rise. And, and that makes it even more important that we gather here and we find solutions and provide stability in a world which is becoming increasingly complex. And we see that just this week, conflict breaking out in the Middle East, and this has been a feature of these meetings. We'll get into some of the potential impacts and energy issues in the Eurozone. I want to talk about Spain's economy first. The WIO came out yesterday, revision upwards once again in 2023 for the Spanish economy. I think 2.5% GDP growth forecasted, uh, outpacing a lot of peers throughout the Eurozone. How do you see and how do you explain resilience of the Spanish economy? Indeed, I mean, the, the Spanish economy is showing a remarkable resilience and we've had a very strong recovery uh, since 2021 with growth, uh, you know, out, out exceeding 6% in 21, 5.8% in 22, and now this year all, uh, all analysts and are forecasting around 23 2.5%, so above 2%, and around 2% for 2024. Uh, we are um, outpacing, as you said, uh, some of our peers. And I think that's due to two reasons. First, uh, we are more resilient than others on the energy front. I'm sure we will come back to this in a second. And so we were able to withstand uh, Russia's war against Ukraine and the impact on the energy market better than other European countries. And then secondly, the recovery plan. Uh, since 2020, we have implemented a very ambitious reform and invest in investment program thanks to the European Next Generation EU funds. And that is uh, enabling our economy to continue to have strong growth, but also to undergo and to kick start um, an in-depth structural transformation and modernization process, which I think is going to continue to lead to stronger growth and more resilience going forward. Well, so let's talk about these energy issues and some of the risks to the downside that you see. Um, you know, Spain has relied heavily on Russian energy products across the Eurozone, that's been true. I think Russia accounted for 75% of Spanish energy needs. This was pre-COVID, back in 2020. How are you thinking, last winter was more mild than many expected, that helped the situation, but how are you thinking about the situation going into this winter? Well, those numbers are reflecting mostly the EU as a whole and maybe some European, East European, Central and East European economies. In the case of Spain, we would like to have a very diversified portfolio. Uh, we have in Spain one third of the regasification capabilities of the whole EU and gas is, is traveling to Spain through pipelines from, from Algeria, also by boats, you know, coming from the US and other uh, gas production uh, um, uh, countries, but we also have have a high penetration of renewables and a very diversified energy mix and that's what has enabled Spain to withstand better than others the blow coming from the uh, um, Russia's war against uh, Ukraine but we have not uh, uh, we have not been complacent at all 
mine. Spain was to a certain extent the canary in the gold mine, mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the mine, yeah. because we started to feel that energy prices were coming up already in 2021 because of our very flexible price setting mechanism. And we started to take measures by then, which have enabled us to have also inflation going down faster than in other countries. And we're already around between two and three percent, which also is providing a strong competitiveness for Spanish companies right now. So the diversification has helped in getting ahead of even other EU countries. I saw from the ECB this week there was some concern, given the conflict now in the Middle East, mm. war breaking out in Israel, potential energy shocks from that. Is that something you're thinking about, colleagues are thinking about? It seems to be a theme that slowly realize, realizing and dawning on folks here in Marrakesh this week. Well, it's, it's uh, um, quite clear, I think, that geopolitical tensions are now manifesting themselves also in outbreak of conflict, you know, throughout the world. And, and that is bringing more uncertainty uh, throughout the world also. So that makes these meetings even more momentous, more important than ever, because we need geoeconomy to contribute to stability. We need the global safety net to provide financial stability, to support most vulnerable countries. As I was saying a moment ago, to provide stability and confidence where geopolitics is actually destabilizing more than anything right now. So uh, let's go to Eurozone-wide issues for a moment. I want to talk about monetary policy in the ECB. Spain has lower inflation than other economies in the Eurozone. How do you feel that the ECB is handling heterogeneity across economies? Do you think they're on the right path now with interest rate hikes? Will we see more going forward? Not asking you to... Uh, you know, pre-run anything yeah. that President Lagarde might do, but your view from the Spanish side? I think it is tricky, that, uh, but that's always the case. Uh, within a heterogeneous uh, economy, such as the Eurozone, there is always uh, one country is growing faster than another, one, another country is having more inflation than another. So it is tricky to articulate monetary policy when you still have such a heterogeneous economic uh, zone, monetary integration. But um, I hope they get it right. You know, my understanding is that there was a very fast rise of interest rates, but they are going to pause for a while. And I think that's quite wise because you have countries such as Spain, which have strong growth, low inflation. Other countries are very close to a recession and have higher inflation. So we better get it right because we need to to ensure that we manage inflation and inflationary expectations and we go back to the 2% target in the mid-run, but without weakening uh, the European economy at a point in time where we need to be strong, obviously, to also withstand and, and face uh, global challenges around us. And this situation, not unique to the ECB, the Fed, obviously not the same heterogeneity yeah. that they deal with in the US, but also fast interest rate rises and now maybe heading into that pausing phase and seeing the monetary policy mm. transmission. Let me talk about the EU and China for a moment. When we met back in April, you said, and I remember this, you know, Europe cannot turn its back on China. In the six months since, we've just seen this anti-dumping investigation that the Commission's going to start related to vehicles. Do you see any change in the relationship between the EU and China over the last six months? Or continuing where we were back in April about the need for competition, but also cooperation where appropriate. Yeah, I don't think there's any change in, in the stance. I mean, the EU is a, is a global trade powerhouse, and we need to keep our relations with all our main trading partners, and China is obviously a very, very large and relevant trading partner, as well as a very important player from a geopolitical uh, point of view. So I, I don't think we can turn our back on China. At the same time, we need to ensure that the uh, f global framework and our trade policies ensure that there's a level playing field and a fair trading uh, framework, you know? And, and so these are normal measures, and uh, this is a, an investigation which I am sure will be conducted uh, with a view to ensuring that there's fair trading conditions for players throughout the world. So I wouldn't see any change in this regard. I think that the EU is a bit of a, in the middle, you know, of, of, the, um, of the world economy. And we're also very directly impacted by geopolitical tensions. And we need to find ways to, to bring back stability, peace, 
and have a rules-based uh, global trade framework that continues to provide uh, prosperity, stability uh, and wealth throughout the world as it has done for the past decades. So you mentioned the word stability. Let's talk about the stability and growth pack. EU mm. fiscal rules. I know you've been <laughs> speaking about this recently. Yeah. What can we expect going forward? Is there a return coming uh, to EU fiscal rules? Well, uh, obviously we need to uh, finish the ongoing review of our fiscal rules so that we have a fiscal framework which is fit for purpose, which uh, en enables us to continue to have strong growth and job creation and the massive investment needs to tackle the twin digital and green transitions, but at the same time ensuring fiscal stability in, in the mid to long run. And that uh, requires for all of us to continue on a downward path for our uh, debt to GDP and deficit to GDP ratios. In the case of Spain, for the time being, we are able to do it. We have uh, reduced our debt to GDP ratios very fast five percentage points in one year, almost 10 percentage points in two years. Uh, we're profiting from strong growth to resume this downward path. And also the deficit to GDP ratio will go back to 3% next year in 2024. And this we are able to achieve in a context of strong growth and job creation. And this kind of uh, you know, consistent approach is the one we need to achieve with our fiscal rules. We're working very hard with our uh, partners. Uh, next week we will have another Eurogroup and ECOFIN meeting. Yes. And I hope that we can make progress so that we have new fit for pur purpose fiscal rules by the end of the year. That's the goal, to get the rules in by Absolutely. the end of the year. Otherwise, in 2024, it would happen automatically. There'd be a reversion back, is that? I don't think anybody wants to go yeah, back so to the old rules. I think that, the yeah, absolutely. I think that there's a unanimous understanding that we're not in the same place we were pre-pandemic. All countries have seen a strong increase of their deficit and debt to GDP ratios. But also we see the massive invest public and private investment needs uh, for the European economy to continue to lead and to have the technological lead in, in these uh, new green and digital economies. You know? So from this point of view, I think there's a unanimous call for all of us to agree on new fiscal rules which are fit for purpose by the end of the year. And I hope we'll get there. Okay, so we will look forward to the meeting next week at any update mm. uh, we hear on the fiscal rules. We're all paying close attention to that. I'm going to move to IMF World Bank issues in a moment. I want to encourage everyone, we have some questions coming in already, askac.org for everyone watching right now. Submit your questions. We'll get to as many as we can. But let's talk about the other hat you wear mm -hmm. during this week. Chair of the IMFC, International Monetary Financial Committee, Advisory Board to the Board of Governors here at the IMF. One of the most interesting things that happened on the U.S. side was Under Secretary of Treasury Jay Shambaugh's speech a few weeks ago mm. about how the U.S. saw the quota issue and IMF reform more broadly. So I wanted to start there at quotas. What do you expect this week? The word we've been hearing in every conversation with ministers is equiproportional. <laughs> uh, and I think there's yeah. been a lot of talk about that. Your view as chair mm. of the IMFC. Well, as I was saying a moment ago, in this uh, trouble, troubled world, you know, turbulent times uh, from the geopolitical point of time, uh, point in time, it's more important than ever that geoeconomy contributes to stability and and confidence building, and that's why we need to. I hope that the meetings this week allow us to put on track uh, a number of measures that enable us to have a strong, adequately financed uh, global safety net that can ensure financial stability but also support most vulnerable countries. Uh, also a framework that facilitates debt relief for highly indebted and most vulnerable countries also. And uh, of course we need to continue to work uh, on a global multilateral framework that also provides for fair rules-based uh, trade system. That that guarantees that we can still profit from the synergies of global value chains uh, in, in an undistorted framework, you know. That would be the aim. I hope these week's meetings put on track uh, the necessary measures so that by the end of the year we have an adequately resourced uh, framework that is able to, to face uh, today's challenges. No, I, I take that point because no one, I think, in, in all the conversations I've had, no one wants to come out of these meetings with at least a roadmap forward or where we get toward the end of the year. The sticking point, of course, is about shares and reform of shares. Do you increase and keep the proportion of the shares? And is there a signal to a broader reform of the quota process? Regardless of what happens in this cycle, do you think the quota process itself needs to be looked at in a more holistic way, maybe in the next review cycle? It's quite clear that the world has changed yeah. since the Bretton Woods 
Woods institutions uh, were created. We were just looking, we were just looking <laughs> at the picture of Bretton Woods. Yeah. You know, it's so impressive to yeah. have this picture here in Marrakech. But it is 75 how, years old. Absolutely, and how the world has changed, you know, in these 75 years. I think when we met back in the spring, I told you that if these institutions had not been invented then, we would have to invent them and yeah. set them up that. now, you know. Yeah. They play such a key role for the global stability and, and confidence and also contributing to peace throughout the world. So I, I think that the Bretton Woods institutions are still at the heart and are at the core of the global financial safety net. We need to reinforce them, but they of course need to be updated so that they reflect today's economy and provide the right responses for today's challenges. I think we're on track you know, to, to deliver this review, this reform, and I hope that these week's meetings are actually helpful in moving in the right direction. Good. It's something we'll be following all week very closely. I think one of the biggest questions people are asking hmm. during the meetings. I want to ask another part that came from the U.S. position on this speech, and that's about the IMF's mandate versus the World Bank's mandate. Very clear from the U.S. position and Under Secretary Shamo's speech, we, he was calling it, and the press called it a back-to-basics speech, hmm. meaning the IMF needs to focus on core, and the World Bank can take climate as a priority, as President has said he will. How do you see the mandates between the two institutions? I think that the, one of the areas where the world has changed is that climate action and climate change is having an impact which is a structural impact but also a short-term stability impact. You know, When there is a hurricane or there is a catastrophe that hits a country, uh, we see that that is having a, a very direct short-term impact on their ability to also withstand uh, their international payments. And so we cannot say that climate is exclusively a structural matter to be dealt with by the World Bank. I think that the, the fact that we're also looking at uh, climate action and climate vulnerabilities and resilience as a, as a, a phase or a, as, a, as an element which is key also to ensure financial stability throughout the world, I think that's wise. You know, otherwise we would be closing our eyes and having an ostrich ap approach. But I think that the change in the mandate of the World Bank that will be agreed in the course of the week is a very positive development because it will also enable the two institutions to be much more complementary mm -hmm. and much more synergetic at the same time delivering better results for all of us. Yeah. And this would be the most positive thing to come out of this week of really we've been talking about it so much being able to deliver real results showing to people the effectiveness of these institutions mm. that's really helpful and I think that you know what you say goes to the point we were talking about earlier the world has changed a lot mm. since Bretton Woods in 1944 and the way you might think of the structural impact or fiscal impact of climate also has to be rethought mm -hmm. and I know both institutions are trying to do that. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to get to some questions online here. First question, and I, I vaguely remember we had a similar question in April, this will not surprise you, it's about uh, Spain's youth unemployment. So Spain's youth unemployment has fallen dramatically in the past few years. It still has a way to go, getting back to pre-crisis levels. Uh, what, are, what policies are going on, digitization? How is this being prioritized within the Spanish government? Well, this is, this is certainly one of our top priorities, and we've made good progress in the last years. Actually, we have recovered, we, we're back in the, to the unemployment levels, not, not pre-COVID, but pre-financial crisis financial 2008, crisis. you know, which that. is very yeah. good news. But obviously, Spain continues to be an outlier in, in European terms. So when we form the new government, which I hope will, will happen quite soon, um, <laughs> achieving full employment and bringing uh, youth unemployment to the uh, European average is our top priority. And we can do it because thanks to the investments and reforms which are underway, if we continue to modernize the structure of the Spanish economy and uh, heavily invest as we are doing in training, skilling, reskilling, digital skills, etc., I think that we are going to provide opportunities for all the young that want to work to find a good job uh, going forward in this new green and digital economy. It is a challenge, but it's also a great opportunity. And in the case of Spain, we are really doing it. You know, we are not letting this opportunity pass without jumping on the right uh, wagon. And that it dovetails into another question I have here, which today is International Day of the Girl. We were talking about that yes. earlier. What about gender gap in Spain? How are you mm. addressing those issues? Also factors into the youth unemployment conversation, I'm sure. Yes, and we were just saying, you know, how, how important it is that the Nobel Prize for yes. Economy this year has gone to not only a woman, but an expert that has been researching into go the gender gap yes. and, 
and and this is so interesting well spain is one of the uh, is an example because since democracy came to the country it is a the, the gender gap has gone down dramatically and in the last five years we've taken a number of measures for example equal uh, paternity and maternity leave rules to ensure that there is transparency with regard to equal pay in companies a number of measures to ensure uh, adequate participation of women in, in in the public sector and institutions all these measures are going in the right direction and explain why the gender gap has gone dramatically down in Spain all indicators show that we are amongst the countries with the lowest uh, gap right now but there's still uh, room to, to go and more importantly that that uh, what we see also within the political debate uh, even in Spain you know with these uh, new movements ultra conservative movements ex ultra right wing parties they are trying to to go back you know they they are there's a there's a boomerang uh, reaction against this kind of moves which shows that we need to fight for equal rights because uh, you know what what has been gained can be lost very fast if we don't continue to make progress towards a more equal and a fairer society also a more efficient one huh? and and this question, building on what you said, you're talking about progress in the Spanish economy and how it compares to other Euro economies. Spain assumed presidency of the EU Council this year. There's a question about your priorities. And what I'm wondering, in addition to this question, is how you maintain European unity. We mm. saw so much European unity in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And only naturally, as time goes, divisions mm. appear. That's what happens in the US, it's happened in mm. Europe. But how do you now, with Spain assuming that presidency, maintain that sense of unity that I think was so critical to pushing back, both financially, military, economically, against Russia? You're absolutely right that I think the European response to the pandemic was the right one. And the European response to the Russia's war against Ukraine was also the right one. Yeah? And it was based on three principles, unity, determination, and solidarity. And I think these three principles should guide us going forward also. The Spanish presidency takes place at a, at a, in a semester where we're in a relatively good position to lead these debates because Spain has done its homework. <laughs> As I explained a moment ago, we're in a good position with regards to fiscal stability, also energy reform, migration, you know, all these key debates we are leading and we've already had some success uh, in the area of migration. I hope we will have uh, successful outcomes in energy reform and, and also the fiscal rule reform um, and that by the end of the year, we can have some of the building blocks that may enable Europe to continue to, to travel uh, towards the European elections that will take place next year uh, in a, as strong uh, and united as possible manner. Uh, it is challenging because the world has become more complicated, you know, and what we're seeing now in the Middle East, you were referring now at the beginning, is, is just adding uh, complexity, you know, to what already was a very challenging environment. But these three principles should really guide us forward. They have served us right, you know, since the EU was created. They have served us right and well uh, to respond to the pandemic and, and to Russia's war against Ukraine. And the, these should be the three principles guiding us uh, going forward. It seems to me as we're talking, I'm thinking of how much is at stake to, from now to the end of the year. We talked about stability and growth tech. We talked about quotas. These two or three months between here, the IMF meetings, COP28 coming in Dubai, and then coming to the end of the year, it seems like a critical time for multilateralism to show its effectiveness. Absolutely, and I see a continuum. You know, I've seen discussions in the G20. We met, leaders met a couple of weeks ago in, in India, yes, in like Delhi. Yes, yeah, but, yeah. but it was a very, I think that good progress was made there. Then we had a, an, an extraordinary ECOFIN meeting uh, in Santiago de Compostela in Spain which was a, an unprecedented historical meeting because we gathered together European finance ministers and Latin American and Caribbean finance ministers. We also discussed the multilateral framework and how to reinforce our global safety net with them there. Now we're having these meetings in Marrakech. We will certainly have COP28 in, in November. This is, there's a continuum here. Uh, which I hope will continue to provide stability and confidence and you know uh, uh, trying to solve our conflicts and divergences through dialogue and cooperation and move away from conflict and instability which is um, the name of the day in so many areas right now. Yeah, I can't remember a time where we had these three major multilateral events, G20, IMF, World Bank, COP, back to back to back like this. Mm. So it is an important moment to prove the effectiveness as we were talking about. We have about five minutes left. I want to get to one or two more questions. 
okay, this, I'm glad this was asked. This has come up in almost every uh, meeting we've had. The idea of de-dollarization mm. that has certainly come up in the U.S. now, somewhat in response to sanctions on Russia, but also trends that have been building for a long time. But a range of emerging markets and developing economies at least trying to diversify away, diversify away from the dollar, maybe towards the euro or maybe also away from the euro and mm. other currencies. How do you see this trend? What does it mean for Europe? Well, I think it is happening, uh, that the debate is happening and that there are mm, some countries and jurisdictions that are interested in trying to make it happen, yeah. you know, that the, the role of the dollar goes down uh, as compared to what it had since the end of World War II. Yeah. Uh, and so I think it's very good to be aware of it and it's not uh, very useful or very productive to try to ignore it. Um, and I don't think this debate is going to go away or these trends are going to go away because there are important leaders you know, throughout the world that are really calling for a, a change you know, in, the, in the financial balance throughout the world, if I may call it this way, explain it this way. I think the euro is the second world currency and from the European perspective we have every interest in making it uh, as important as possible and there, there are a number of measures and actions that are undertaken to try to ensure that it continues to, to grow uh, its influence throughout the world. And now what I think is that the uh, role of the dollar is, is very prominent throughout the world, you know, and the uh, U.S. economy and the international safety net is very powerful and it has served us very well. It has served the world well, you know, this these, uh, framework has provided uh, the world with stability, with confidence. It has enabled the uh, exponential growth of trade throughout the world, global value chains. As I was saying a moment ago, we need to ensure that we preserve the synergies and the prosperity that this global order has brought to us. And in this moment, when so many reforms and changes are taking place, we need to ensure that we upgrade and update our mechanisms, but without throwing the baby with the backwater, yes. you know, without losing the bene many benefits that this uh, world order has brought to all countries throughout the world. I appreciate what you said, because I think in the U.S. we sometimes have an overly um, complacent stance on the dollar of, yes, it's the international reserve currency, there aren't really viable alternatives, you hear this a lot from senior U.S. financial officials, and taking what you said of, yes, international reserve currency, that doesn't mean there's not room for updating and improving. I wonder, I saw recently that Minister Lindner and Minister LeMaire wrote about further completion of capital markets union. This has been a long-standing debate in the, in the euro area. Is this something that you think would help, actually, the international role of the euro? Well, certainly would, yes, because, well, there are many asymmetries between the EU and the U.S. Uh, one of them is we don't have a, 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 a united a euro bond. Yeah. We don't have a like you do, you know, which so uh, we still have a somewhat fragmented debt market, sovereign debt market. Market. We've made a lot of progress huh, in last years, and I think that uh, you know um, a more stable framework is is also helpful for the euro. But obviously, there is a divergence there. And then the second key difference is that you have very in in the U.S. you have very integrated financial markets, which are providing liquidity and financing for the real economy, and so companies can also become larger and grow. Uh, the integration of real markets, goods markets, services markets, and financial markets in Europe is still an unfinished uh, business. Uh, we will try also to make as much progress as possible by year end, but I don't think we'll be able to solve all the problems. You know, under the Spanish presidency, to be very honest. That's, that's a very yeah. realistic and honest <laughs> yeah. answer. Um, a final question online, and then I'll ask you one concluding question, but it actually relates to updating and modernizing the euro and maybe putting on your Minister for Digital Transformation yeah. app. What about the digital euro? This mm. is a conversation that we've been hearing a lot about. I think the ECB has really been leading on this compared to other central banks, including the Fed. What do you see going forward? Do you see a use case for a retail CBDC, central bank digital currency, for those who aren't following it as closely, a digital euro in 2020? for beyond? Well, I think that the, we've, we've been, I've, and I personally have been very supportive of, of Europe undertaking this work because also I see that these developments are taking place in other parts of the world. China, but also uh, India, for example, yeah. is an example at heart. Yeah. It's of countries. very interesting yeah. what's happening in Asia. So I don't think that we should just, again, have an ostrich approach of let's ignore it, yeah. but rather 
well, what's going on, let's study, is this interesting or not? So I think it's very good that the ECB has uh, undertaken this work. Now we need to see whether there is really an advantage for citizens to have this uh, central bank digital currency, what the impact would be on the financial sector and whether this would contribute significantly to the role of the euro in the world. I think digitalization is an unstoppable trend throughout the world. And we need to see in every area and every sector and every part of our economies and our societies how to steer the process in a manner which contributes to welfare, to better societies, to better functioning democracies, to a more stable world or not, you know, and that, that calls for artificial intelligence or the digital euro, you know, and, and everything in between. No, I appreciate what you said because it's about effectiveness. What is the benefit that it's delivering? Mm. Not the item for the sake of itself, but what can it do and keeping mm. that in mind. Final question I'll ask you. We have the honor of hosting you at the beginning of the week, yes. uh, not at the end of the week. So if we were sitting down with you at the end of IMF World Bank Week, I would ask you, was it successful? What I'll ask you now at the beginning hmm. of the week is what should we look for coming at the end of the hmm. week when you have the IMFC press conference at the end? What yes. should we be looking for as the tangible measures of success coming yes. out of this week? Well, I'd say if we manage to make progress towards a reinforcement of the global safety net, you know, reinforcement of the IMF uh, and putting on track uh, a process that may deliver an increase of quotas by the end of the year, uh, some other mechanisms to provide relief to most indebted and most vulnerable countries, then that would have been a, a successful week. And I'm really confident that we will certainly have a, a productive uh, week. There will be many meetings and exchanges on debt relief, on financing for Ukraine, on green uh, financing. So, so uh, overall, I am quite confident that we will be able to make progress. And uh, if we cross each other here on, on in Marrakesh <laughs> by the end of the week, we'll, we'll, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that we you, you will tell me, yes, you know, you were right. <laughs> well, I'll take you up on that. Vice President Calvino, thank you. We know how busy your schedule is. We appreciate you coming again once to the Atlantic Council. It means so much to hear from you, hear the perspective on Spain's economy, on Eurozone economy, on the global economy. We look forward to continuing this conversation going forward. It's a great pleasure and all the best to all those watching us. Thanks for everyone joining us today. Stay with us throughout the day. Atlantic Council Live from IMF World Bank meetings in Marrakesh. We have events coming today on International Day of the Girl. And then at 1 o'clock in partnership with CNBC, we'll do our special event on decoding the world economic outlook, what was in the document and what was left out. Thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of the day.